Hello, beautiful people. To today's guest and my fellow flow women business leaders in the making. I am Geet. I am a flow member. I am a recruiter, trainer, an author, and a human resource missionary. Today's session of Startup Caravan is one of the initiatives of Fiki's Flows Mumbai chapter. As all of you know that Flow Mumbai has taken upon itself the vision of sustainable livelihoods, environment, and girls, girls, uh, girls' livelihood, sustainability, and environment as its 2020 vision. And uh, despite the pandemic, they have been bringing to us many business leaders and eminent experts from different parts of the industry in order to further entrepreneurship as well as build the sustainability of livelihoods. And Startup Caravan is playing a very important role towards this. So spearheaded by Archana Khosla Barman, who's the founder partner of Vertices Partners, one of the fastest growing boutique law firms in Bombay. Uh, she brings for us uh, Mr. Abhishek Fogla uh, to talk to us about creating a business plan for funding. Abhishek is co-partner in Excella Fiduciary. I hope Abhishek, I have pronounced it correctly. Absolutely, ma'am. It's perfect. Okay. Uh, and he has, for somebody who looks so young, it's uh, very difficult to believe that he has had the distinction of raising 5,000 crores for 90 of his clients over his career, 40% uh, of which has been raised in the past five years. He's had experience with debt, equity, as well as structured finance. His core expertise is in banking and financial service uh, industry, and especially inclusive finance. Today, he's going to share with us his expertise towards preparing a business plan and looking at different aspects of funding. So he's going to cover not only creating the plan, but also exploring what are the different options of funding that we can access, our readiness for it, as well as how to go about it. And in case any of the members have any questions other than this, they are most welcome to put down their specific query in the chat box and uh, we will make sure that Abhishek has some time to address it. Archana, you have something to add? Sure. Thanks, Geet, for the warm introduction. And welcome, Abhishek, to our 12th session of the Startup Caravan series. Both uh, we and our participants have been eagerly looking forward to this session. In fact, there have been a lot of hours about uh, having this session done earlier. But I'm very excited today that we are finally having it. So Abhishek, as you can see that access to capital is directly proportionate to growth of the company. Therefore, I feel it is the initial stages that are always the most difficult. And in this context, if you could share your views in today's session, and I thought before we start this session, I would just lay out a few thoughts, which if you could address in your session would be very helpful for entrepreneurs, because these are certain commonly asked questions by entrepreneurs. So if you would like, I'll put them on the chat box as well. But just to give you a little broad uh, sense of the you know things I have in mind in which you deal with day in and day out. The first and foremost being should initial capital preferably be institutional or smart capital or should, should it be to go about what is available for the founders? And to what extent of leverage does the founder have to get access to such capital? The second question is, is equity always the preferable option or does debt or convertible structures become equivalently important, especially given the fact that we all know that the cost of equity is far higher than the cost of debt. And is this decision also based on whether the, the business can at that point of time be valued at all or not? 
the third commonly asked question uh, abhishek is that should a founder be very worried about stake dilution and really push for non price rounds it's related to the earlier question where about looking at convertible structures safe or other instrument or do you think it is always about focusing on the size of the pot as against the quantity in the spoon and the last but not the least important question is that entrepreneurs once they reach a certain stage and level they tend to get a lot of uh, they get ample inbound opportunities so what is the importance of having an investment banker by their side at that point of time is it only just the introductions or are we looking at the intangibles as well in terms of the connects the bandwidth which can be eased being a you know single point of contact so uh, with this uh, abhishek i'll not take too much of more time and i would request you to dive right in perfect thank you archana so i think uh just can you repeat the third question uh the dilution part of it what was it exactly yeah yeah so i was asking was that should a founder be very worried about getting diluted and no. therefore push more for non price round you know look at more convertible notes and safe uh, sure 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 so all very relevant questions achna so i will perhaps i uh, the way i wanted to do this perhaps if it's okay with everyone is to have um, about 30 to 35 minutes where i will breathe, breathe through the dry, through the deck and then perhaps we can have about 25 to 30 minutes of q and a right so where we can uh, where i will address these questions first once we've gone through the presentation i've noted on all four questions of yours if that's okay perfect thank you so much perfect and once again uh, gigi and archana uh, thank you so Thank you for having this. It is an absolute pleasure, uh, you know, to be here. And Gigi, uh, Archana knows me quite well, so I'll just um, tell you something that uh, uh, the 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 uh, organization flow is very dear to my heart because uh, out of the five thousand crores, almost all of it has been done for impact enterprises. So basically, for social enterprises. In social enterprises, as you said, financial inclusion is a key area for me, and the end beneficiaries are all women. but also i've done a lot of work in affordable education affordable healthcare and women empowerment has been a key focus area for me now that could mean something as trite as low cost sanitary napkins it could be perhaps you know having uh, proper sanitation facilities built it could be uh, you know uh, uh, gynecological or pediatric healthcare especially for the rural areas or underprivileged areas these are all areas of focus for us wherein for profit enterprises are being built which are actually getting investable capital in them so i just wanted to add on that flow is particularly dear to my heart because i genuinely believe that half of mankind or half of the human race is our women and i think the the potential especially for india is waiting to be unlocked i think the percentage of women population sort of um, uh, participating in the economy is still atrociously low as compared to other global standards Uh, you know as compared to the west and i think this is going to be the key factor for uh, for for india's stupendous economic growth which is yet to come ek thing abhi hum re humko kaam hai hum hum na share wala aa raha hai sir aadmi logo bahut okay sorry okay so so that's to... nice to know yeah yes sir. so i'm so going to look forward to using now. that expertise thank you okay is my screen visible to everyone yes yes okay so i am happy to share this presentation with anyone who would require it you can write to me on my email id or i can circulate it to flow and vertices and uh, you know uh, more than happy to share the knowledge nothing proprietary about this so okay i wanted to start off on a more subjective note for those of you who are on the fence basically those of you who are looking at potentially diving into entrepreneurship i just wanted to remind you of something that you know it's all very rosy when you hear of mark zuckerberg and uh, you know all the success stories which is sachin bansal or or bini bansal or whoever it is but entrepreneurship is actually very hard and very difficult it is very very attractive so you know i i love this quote which is entrepreneurship is living a few years of your life like most people won't choose to they won't choose to 
so that you can spend the rest of your life like most people can't. So I love this quote and I thought I would share it with you. And a couple of things about the life of an entrepreneur. Yes, it's very job satisfying. It's the best experience, etc. It's very rewarding if you, if you hit it off well. You can become financially independent. You don't have to worry about money for the rest of your life, etc. But also it's very lonely in the beginning. So the, uh, the, the, the co-founder that you have or co-founders that you have is extremely important. Uh, it is full of insecurities. It is full of loneliness. So there will be times when you will wake up with pangs of, you know, how should I say, anxiety at night. It's very common. I've been an entrepreneur as well. I've lost sleep. I've become an insomniac at times and now I've become better. So, you know, you, you start wondering, you know, have I done the right thing? Should I go back to a job? All of these questions start coming to you, which is very normal. If you are committed to this, just keep walking. Perseverance, in my mind, is the one thing that is needed, which is more important than any business plan. Perseverance, just persevere with whatever you, uh, you know, you, you choose to do as your business, whichever field. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, in business plan preparation, right, there are two key documents that are really needed, right? One is a word document or a presentation, which is basically, um, you know, it's when if you've seen an IPO document, I, you know, you uh, see the image on the right, right? You will see this is a draft red heading prospectus of a company. So when you have an IPO, which is coming up, an initial public offering, then all details of the company are disclosed over there. All the risks, all the opportunities, everything about it. Because the stock exchanges warrant that you have to be completely open kimono about it. So, um, you know, the, the one document is a word document or a presentation which lays out the bare bones of your company. In the, for venture capital, I, I suggest that a, a presentation is preferred, a PowerPoint. And in, in investment parlance, it is called a deck, right? So if you are talking to an investor, they'll say, can you share your deck with me? That's the parlance which is used. And then there is an Excel sheet which shows the future cash flows and the financial projections of the company. I've given an example of a picture towards that, but we'll get into more detail now. These are the two key documents. Um, sorry. So the first thing, I'll go into the, work, into the presentation first because that has more of the things which should actually you know, uh, I'll discuss a lot more about them, which will actually be the inputs to the business plan, right? So uh, the first slide is actually the executive summary. It is basically a snapshot of your company. And it says, why should an investor invest in your company? What is so attractive about you? So the first point, which I would recommend is business model. In one line, you should be able to describe it. If you're using a paragraph to describe it, sorry, it's not working, meaning you are not clear about it, right? So for example, let's take any company. Let's take Ola Caps, for instance. Now, Ola Caps, if I were to describe it in, 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 in one go, much before everybody knew about what Ola Caps is, you would just say it's a technology company connecting drivers slash cabs with customers real time in a framework which is transparent because taxis, if you know before, Ola's and Ubers of the world came. There was a lot of you know hidden costs, you know meter tampering, all of that. So over here, it's transparent and in a way which is. So I, I would so you can choose whatever you want for your company, but it has to you have to clearly communicate the value in one line. So that's the business model. And what is the problem that you're fixing? Every great company which is formed is really solving a problem. So what is the problem that you're solving? We move us to the next thing. Now that you have your solution. What is the market for it? Okay, you may have solved a problem, right? But frankly, let's say, for example, the problem that you're solving is vaccination for a particular breed of dogs called Chihuahuas. You have the best vaccination in the world. But how large can you make it? How many Chihuahuas are there in India? And how, how large can you make it? Because So that's the question. So then you'll probably not find it very attractive because it's not a very large business model. So the market is something which is very critical. And I talk about each of these points. The unit economics. Now, what do I mean by unit economics? Sorry, I'm going to go a little fast, otherwise you won't finish in time. So unit economics essentially means that for every product or service that you sell, every type of product or service, let's say I'm selling a shampoo, head and shoulders. When head and shoulders, how much do I sell each head and shoulders for? When I sell it, what are my distribution costs? So then that gives me my net revenue, net of sales costs, right? Then what are the the, 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 the costs that go into it. 
So you start detailing that for each bottle of head and shoulders that I make, what is the cost that will be there, you know, for it. So you put the revenues and the cost in one end and you get what you call as a unit economy. Meaning for one bottle, how much do you spend and how much do you earn? So net net, how much does it give you in terms of profit? Because for profit businesses is all about profit. If a business is not profitable, it's not a business, right? So we get into more of this growth. It's very, very you know, important. Most investors will look at companies which have significant growth potential. Uh, competitive differentiation. Okay, so you are doing this. Uh, you know, you have a great market, you have great unit economics, but if 20,000 people are already doing it, then will you be able to survive? So for example, coming back to my Ola uh, example, if today you were to form an app which was to connect taxi drivers and uh, you know customers, I think you're a little late for that, right? You may be probably a decade late for that. So because establishing that app and actually reaching out to so many customers is a very expensive affair, right? So unless you're doing something dramatically different, like for example, there are a couple of new companies which I know which are doing it only for green vehicles, right? So if you're doing a, a, a Ola type app only for green vehicles which are which are non-polluting, for example, that's that's a differentiation for you. So you have to really come out with what is it that differentiates you with the rest of the market. And the most important thing in any investment private company or public company, frankly, for that matter, is the founding team. So who are the promoters of the business? Who are they? I mean, uh, you know, what is their experience? What is the ethics? Will they take care of the money or not? Can you trust them? Those are some of the things which are very important. So I'm going to get into one by one. So the first thing is market. So in market, the first thing that you look at is the total addressable market. In your product or service, what is the total addressable market that you have, right? So for example, if I'm looking at, uh, let's say, uh, pet food, right? So you have to make a bottoms up analysis that how many, so if you're doing pet foods in, let's say, two categories, dogs and cats. So you have to say, you have to estimate how many dogs and cats are there in India, right? Which are domesticated, which are pets, right? You have to first get to that. Now, out of that, not every breed is going to be, you know, something that you will cater to. So you have to then understand what are the different subbreeds of those pet classes, which you can cater to. And not everyone is going to be able to afford it. So you will have a positioning. You'll say, okay, I'm a premium pet food provider or I'm an affordable pet food provider or whatever it is, right? So you will be targeting a certain socioeconomic class or SEC as we call it. If you're a premium provider, then you will probably be unaffordable for the people who are the lower middle class or the middle class. If you are catering to the affordable ones, the rich will have that certain snob effect where they won't probably come to you. They look at different brands. So there's always a positioning that is needed, which gives you a total addressable market. Okay. In India, for, for premium fed food, my market is $1.5 billion a year. So let's say it's 11,000 crores a year. So that's how you have to say, this is my TAM, the total addressable market. And then you have to come to say that, okay, out of the total addressable market, this is how much I will start targeting year one, year two, year three, year four. You have to keep building towards that, right? Now, often in many businesses, there is both global and local potential. So you do global TAM and local TAM separately, especially in software or technology businesses, right? VCs will not fund you, venture capitalists or seed investors will not fund you venture capital typically, unless you have at least a $1 billion market size in, in India alone. Now, why I'm saying that is very important because if you're going to have a market of $1 billion, then probably you can realistically hope to get maybe what? 10% uh, market share, 5% market share. You know, so if you don't have a, if you have a 10% market share, let's say five years later, then you're looking at, okay, the 1 billion market will probably go, will also be growing. So you will probably have, let's say a $1.5 billion market, assuming certain growth parameters five years later. Out of that 10% will mean you will have a $150 million market, which is something on the order of 1100, 1200 crores. So, agar aapka, so if you have a 1200 crore portfolio, uh, sorry, uh, 1200 crore uh, revenue, then you can potentially look to IPO or be bought out. That's a reasonable chunk of the company, right? That's a reasonable size of the company. If you have a company which is just doing, let's say, five crores of revenues, there is no scope to do an IPO, right? SME IPOs are very illiquid. You don't have too many people who are, you know, investing into it, etc. So let's not even get there. So this is will typically look at at least a $1 billion market size or TAM in India. Alone. Is this yeah. standard? 
sorry to interrupt is this standard for service industry as well as products any any industry ma'am any industry i see but this defines how large your company can grow to in terms of top line okay and top line defines whether the investor can exit or not because if you have a top line of let's say 20 crores five years later you cannot sell the it's highly unlikely you'll be selling the company out as any acquirer will also want size the large the larger the size of the company let's say you have a 2000 crore revenue company then it is much easier to get it sold rather than a 20 crore revenue company excuse me there are so many 20 crore or 30 crore revenue companies which are floating above but very few reach the 2000 crore level which is when you are able to ipo or do an acquisition that is why you look at a 1 billion dollar market size i generally do not pick up deals if i do not see this strategy being met several of my you know investee companies many of them are who are there in this call right they have uh, market sizes which are in excess of 10 billion or 50 billion or even 100 billion dollars okay i see what is the market growth rate because the market is not stagnant the market will also keep growing right uh with the week today uh increase market share over time how much is your company going to target market share so today maybe you are 0.5% of the market but can you really reach let's say 4% or 10% market share in 5 years time that is what you have to convince the investor about cyclicality very important there are certain businesses like education where your fees come in let's say typically march april may june is when your fees come in so if you're any business which is related to schools it's going to be very difficult for you if you want the cyclicality because all your cash over the year is going to be bunched together in a small period of time the the counter to that is that let's say toothpaste or any fmcg category hair oil toothpaste food that will go around the year right it will go the year, year year around so air conditioners are cyclical because in the summers you will sell more of them so cyclicality plays a huge role in cash flow and in the business prospects of any business uh then once you have defined the need and the market what is the solution slash product slash product seed so how well does this solve your need right is it disruptive right are you doing something which 10000 people have done before or are you really having a novel way of doing it which is creating a unique positioning for you in the market is it tested has someone else done it or are you the, the pioneer in this if you are a pioneer it comes with great risk and great reward the pioneer usually becomes a very very large company but at the same time the pioneer has a lot of more risk to it so i know a lot of vcs would not fund the pioneer but who will fund the next company so for example if there is a licious which is delivering meat right which was the pioneer you will you may not find that company but you may find the next one which has now seen ki ha okay this is how you do it now i will form a replica of it now if you are the 10th replica you are not going to get funded but if you are the second or third you probably get funded so is it tested right and what is the stage is it an idea stage is it a proof of concept which is done is it early revenues or have you is it an established company with growth and i'll come to that because the stage i have a separate slide on stage of the company right and then what is the feature set and the differentiation from existing products or solutions right in the market second thing competitive landscape and differentiation so are you a pioneer as i said or are you a me too if you are not the pioneer what's the landscape how many others are there so if you look at for example telecom which is a very very good example you had airtel which came and you had vodafone or hutch as it was known earlier which came in right and then you had idea and spice and aircel and all of those and then when the 2g thing happened then 10 12 companies came. you remember there was telenor there was uh, you know loop mobile there were so many companies ultimately none of them could survive none of the whole long tail could survive ultimately now you have typically three companies in india airtel uh, vodafone and jio these are the three which are this so it become what we call as an oligopoly you have three established players in the sector and pretty much the entire sector is divided among those three players so you have to have a landscape what is the landscape and where do you fit in uh what is your differentiation are you causing disruption are you tackling a problem which is now becoming obsolete so for example uh kodak is a great example of a company now kodak films and cameras used to be the number one brand in its category let's say 30 years back but they never evolved that quickly they never embraced digitalization like a nikon did for example or a canon did right they never embraced it and that made it become obsolete so if a company does not move with your times 
then you become obsolete even though you may be the best player in the sector right now so that's obsolescence is also a big factor in terms of the changing landscape what is your market share what is it today how will it evolve 3 years or 5 years later what is your strategy to gain market share what is the ease of scalability how hard is it to replicate it? for example let's say uh, in archana's business which is a law firm but typically you will have let's say 50 100 clients but if you really want to build a law firm which has 1 lakh clients i don't think globally there is some anyone who is who has been able to build it so you focus on few clients now that few could be 10 it could be 100 be 500 but not there's a limit to that whereas if you look at an fmcg brand like a shampoo or a soap or whatever it is that is a very different category so you actually need crores of consumers for that right so it really depends on what is the ease of scalability so once you have your sorry i think something went on so so ease of scalability is critically important and scalability is very different from scalability of quality so if you are scaling yes i will scale let's say you have an e-commerce business and you are scaling you are taking in orders left right and center but then you are defaulting aapne bola ki aap parso tak de doge but you are giving it one week later your goods are coming tattered torn missing you ordered a phone but a stone comes in so all of these are quality issues so scalability and scalability of quality are two very different things you have to have a company where scalability of quality is there along with the scalability. You have to have barriers to entry. Let's say you form a business, but anyone else can come into the business. Like in my business, investment banking, anyone can come in. I just need a desk and a chair, right? I can start raising funds as well. But here the barrier to entry is the reputation, is the pedigree. What have you done in the past, right? So as a newcomer, I find it very difficult to get business if I haven't done or if I don't have an impact. But every business has barriers to entry. The higher the barriers to entry, the better it is from an investor's perspective because that makes you super valuable. Uh, intellectual property. Do you have intellectual property in your business? Or are you, can anyone do it, right? So for example, you have a product in which you have IP and nobody can replicate it. It becomes so much more valuable. And from an acquisition perspective, right? When you are building something, ultimately the investor has to exit. So when I get acquired, right, the acquirer will always, you know, grapple with the question whether it's build versus buy. Matlab, do I build something from scratch? So if it's a Baiju's, which is acquiring a white hat junior, right, which is the latest acquisition, which is, you know, in the news, right, would Baiju's, for example, right, focus on building its own computer science curriculum and doing it or else should I buy it? So there is always a question in the acquirer's mind whether I should build versus buy. So if you make something which has such high values to entry, where the, the a deep pocketed brand, which, whether Indian or foreign, says that, Chalo yaar, hai, I will buy it. There's no point waiting and building it. Then you have really created value for yourself as well as for your investors. What is the margin profile? Now, for the people who are not very comfortable with finance, I'd urge you to focus now. Unit economics, as I told you, gross margin. So you have, if you're selling, okay, I'll just take a shampoo bottle, right? A shampoo bottle when you're when you're selling it. So you have a revenue which you get from your uh, from a net revenue which you get from your sales channel, right? Uh, what are the costs? The cost that is required from producing it to shipping it to you know uh, to landing it to the consumer that is called your cost of goods sold or COGS, which comes into your unit economics. Your revenue minus your cost of goods sold gives you a gross margin. If you, if any of you have questions later, you can you can ask me. Time is short, so I'm just racing away. Now your margins will evolve with scale. So so how large can your gross margins become? Because as you build more and more scale, your costs become lower and lower. Because when you do procurement in bulk, you will be uh, you know uh, negotiating better deals with your vendors. When you're when you're producing in bulk, for example, then you will get efficiencies. All of these things happen. So there is a very sharp drop in the cost of goods sold till it comes to a plateau where it's very difficult to reduce it further. So that is your gross margin and your evolving margins with scale. Now, what is your cross sell potential? Once you have a customer, you shampoo to bech diya. Now, can you start selling hair conditioner to him or her also? Can you start selling hair oil to him or her? So you start looking at allied products. What else can you sell to them? Whether it's hair wax, 
So if you if you if you notice any company which is there, we'll always be looking to see how can I milk my consumer or my customer further. CAC. Some of you may not be aware of it, but it's called customer acquisition cost. So when I acquire a new customer, there's a cost to it. No customer comes to you for free. Everyone has to do hard work. So for example, uh, let's say in SaaS, uh, uh, software business, right? Software as a service. Every customer that you acquire has a certain cost to it. Now that cost could be a function of human resources. It could be a function of marketing. It could be a function of advertising. So what is the CAC associated with it, right? Because that will tell you how much you are spending to acquire a customer. In many businesses I have seen, especially insurance, in insurance companies, the premium that you collect from the customer in the initial years, it is not uncommon to have a situation where you are spending more than the premium collected in the first year to acquire the customer. So net net, you are running at a loss, but you're investing for the future because you're betting that the customer won't leave me and go. I will retain that. I'll come to more of that later. But I'm, the customer acquisition cost is very, very important in the margin profile. What are the fixed costs or development costs? What is your EBITDA or your earnings before interest tax, depreciation, and amortization? And what is your profit after tax? Now, what is your growth? The next big factor is growth. How will my number of customers acquired go up? What are the channels? Will it be B2B? Will it be B2C? Will it be B2B2C? Business to business to consumer. How will my average spending per customer go up? I may start off with a customer gaining only, for example, 1,000 rupees from a customer per year. But can I push that average revenue per consumer from 1,000 to 2,000? Because that drastically improves my profitability. What are the different markets that will open up in terms of customer segments? Right? So if I'm starting off with, let's say, Tamil Nadu, how soon can I go to Karnataka, Andhra, Maharashtra, Punjab? Or if I'm starting off with, let's say, uh, you know, a brand, let's say Gillette, right? Now, Gillette is typically a male dominated brand, right? Because you have shaving for Gillette, I mean, men's shave. But several decades ago, Gillette realized that there is a huge potential with women as well, where they get rid of unwanted body care. So there is an entire range which they start producing pink razors and whatnot, and you know, hair removal creams and whatnot. So they got into that. So you have to then plan out what are my customer segments and how I will get into each of them. It's a strategic call. Customers from my competitors, very critical. Show me. So an investor will ask you for that. What about cross-sell of own or third-party products and services? Now you would have seen, for example, if you go to Swiggy, if you scroll down, you're order, it's a food ordering app, but you can also buy mutual funds over there. You can make financial investments from there. You can buy term insurance from there. Very, very strange. But what Swiggy realizes is that if my customer is scrolling down on my app, if he buys it, why not? Yeah? Sell it to him. Achha, insurance companies pays huge commissions. So agar mere, if I have two crore consumers, and let's say I'm able to sell even two lakh insurance policies per month, and every policy I get at least a thousand rupees as commission. So two lakh into thousand, which is two thousand lakh, or twenty crores of income per month will come into me. So you have to see what will be your own products and your third-party products which you can cross sell. And typically, when you do growth, uh, you know, uh, projections, I would advise you to do three scenarios: optimistic, pessimistic, and realistic. You say you do you don't know how business is going to expand. It's a function of how your company pans out as well as the entire market. Tomorrow, I just saw in the news today that Pakistan is complaining that you know there may be another surgical strike. If that happens, believe me, capital will fly out. If there's a war that happens, the economy will go like this, dharam. Right? So you don't know what's going to happen. So you typically do three scenarios. One is a very optimistic, very bullish scenario, one is a very bearish scenario. And one is the realistic scenario where you end up. So you normally would want to show the investor all three. And they would, if any astute investor would ask you for these different scenarios so that they can see, yeah, cha, okay, if even if it's a pessimistic scenario, at least the company will not be bound up. So you'd have to convince them around it. Upside, to theek, everyone knows that you'll get lots of upside. But what will be the downside in the downside scenario? Product roadmap, very critical. In any product that you're building, how is the roadmap? What are the features that you're going to be putting in? What are the timelines? How much of money are you going to invest into it? How, many, how much of resources are you, going to, are you going to invest into it? Right? What is the need? How is the market going to evolve? How will it benchmark with my competition? What is my enormity of vision? Most investors look at founders who have very broad vision. 
right? If Vijay Shekhar Sharma had said that I want to form a company with only revenues of let's say thousand crores, when he was starting off, that would have been a very, very, very bold statement to make. But you know, that guy said, I want to build the largest financial, you know, sort of payments company in India. I want to build this. Now he's getting into everything, right? So there's an enormity of vision that here. If you don't have the vision, it's a given. If you have the vision, you may or may not get there. But if you don't have it, so day one, you're written off. So all investors look at founders who have great enormity of vision, increasing customer wallet share. What are the features in my product that I can add to gain more of my wallet of the customer? Founding team, very important, probably the most important thing, especially in early stage uh, investments. I guess the most of the people on this color early stage, the investors will look at who are the people behind it? What are the commitment levels? Do I have a founder who's saying, yeah, uh, you know what, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to be doing my day job, main Monday to Friday, karunga. Saturday, Sunday, but I will do the whole company. Ko ga. Good, worry, sir. Main ko kaam ga. I will work at night, I will do this, I will do bullshit. If you're committed to it, be committed to it. If you're doing things part-time, you yourself don't have the commitment. Sorry, I used a slang which I should. I'm just trying to make a point across that commitment levels, they will see. If you are worried about where you are going to pay your home EMI, please don't come into entrepreneurship. Have those backups in place, have that extra cash in place, make sure that your spouse is earning or you have a big inheritance coming from your father or whoever it is, whatever you want, have your backups in place. Past experience, are you still in entrepreneurs or are you not? Sorry, am I, am I running? I think I'm running too slow. Am I? Achana and Geet? Sorry, yeah. No, I, I, just... I think you're going. Perfect. Okay. okay. Past experience, are they seated entrepreneurs or not? Uh, if they are seated entrepreneurs, you're more likely to get funded. For example, someone like, uh, uh, you know, uh, Cred, right? The founder of Cred had founded a very uh, free charge, right? So he got funded day one. So if you're a senior entrepreneur, you're much more likely to get funded. Complementary skill sets. If you have more than one founder, so if you have two or three co-founders, do they bring complementary skill sets in? That's very important. Interstate shareholding. If three founders are there and one founder has 90%, the other two have 5%, 5%, then what's the skin in the game? Those 5% people can walk up anytime they like. They will say, I will do something better with my life. So there has to be enough skin in the game in terms of interstate shareholding. What are the interpersonal dynamics? This is very important. Now, if that among the three founders, there are two who are always squabbling with each, with each other, it's going to end in disaster. You will invest in the company and the two of them will follow. Again, husband and wife teams, uh, Archana and Vinayak are probably, you know, the successful kind, but you have seen many examples in which things have gone down the drain, right? Uh, for example, uh, Musigma, where you had the, the Hiraj and, uh, you know, his wife, uh, I think the name is Ambika. So, you know, you had, uh, you had Mu Sigma, you had shop tools, all of these places where, you know, the, the problems of, of your home came into your business because a husband and wife are operating it. It can happen the same thing with a, with a mother and son or a brother and sister. You know, if you have your, if you have personal lives coming together, professional lives often take a toll. They can go either way. They can either be very good or they can take a toll for the worse. Nothing good or bad about it. It's just that you have to understand and say that, you know, we will work solidly well as a team. You have to have a founder's agreement, which is why I say that get things in writing, in legal document on stamp paper, so that all scenarios are thought about. Succession planning. If, if the founders basically, if they, God forbid, if they have a demise or if they are rendered incapable, uh, disabled because of something, how do you do the succession then? Right, very important because there has to be continuity in the business. Senior management. What is a one down dream to founders in your organogram or your off chart? Are there any critical hires missing? If they are, then investors are going to worry. How will you get your, your business up and going? What is the senior management profile and your experience? How much of skin in the game do they have? Are you giving them only cash? Because the day you cannot give them cash and things go south, they will run away. So if you incentivize them with stock, that is why the fourth point of general generosity of founding team is ESOPs. The more ESOPs you give, the better it is. Because they, that will create long-term loyalty. Are your one down self-motivated? Or the moment you look away, they start doing their own thing and they start going on Facebook and you know whatever, right? Are they self-motivated or not? 
do they have the innovation and creativity required customer stickiness what is your retention percentage very very critical you will see these terms ltv versus cac ltv is the lifetime value of a customer once you acquire a customer how many shampoo bottles can i sell to him over the next let's say 10 years or 20 years till the point that i can retain him versus what is it costing me to acquire him so if my ltv is for example 10000 rupees and my cac my customer acquisition cost is 1000 rupees i have an ltv to cac ratio of 10 is to 1 meaning if i spend 1 rupee today over the lifetime of the customer over many years i'm going to get 10 rupees from that customer so that is a very very important thing which investors look at what is your cross sell and your arpu increase average revenue per user i've already told you about this reference marketing if i am a if i am a loyal user will i recommend it to archana will i recommend it to geet will i recommend it to abc you know so reference marketing schemes you often incentivize you will often see that you know if you introduce a new customer to me and i in your next shopping bill i will give you 15% off i will give you 20% off or i will give you this amazon voucher and reward why do people do that that's reference marketing lowering cac cac should be lowered as much as possible over time initially your your customer acquisition cost will be high but as you go forward it will start getting lowered word of mouth brand building is most important in the business anyone can spend on advertising but the most important advertising is free which is geet telling archana geet telling abhishek that look i i i experience this product it's really good do try it there's there's no substitute to that exit strategies for any investor there are five or six things over here which is ipo is the desired exit because you get the best valuations on exit mergers and acquisitions so if you have a company which is going to get sold right to a large foreign player or a large domestic player right uh, then you will you know uh, end up with a lot more cash on your investment right you you're going to make a killing second risk sale so when you have an earlier stage investor who sells and a later stage investor who buys that's called a second risk sale the fourth thing is a company buyback let's say you have a company like apple which is generating huge amounts of cash then what happens so the company can say i will buy your shares back so let's say i will offer you 650 dollars a share or 500 dollars a share is very common especially in cash rich companies to buy back what are the timelines for exit are you going to give me exit 20 years later no thank you baba i need to plan for my uh, you know my 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 children's education i need my my i need my money back in in 8 years or 10 years time maximum or i need it back in 3 years or 5 years time so timeline is very important for an investor you can't leave them hanging perennially without giving them an exit and is it going to be a global business versus a local business very important again because if you if you uh, do an ipo for example on nasdaq if you are a tech company which does an ipo overseas then you're going to be much more valuable than if you do your your ipo on nse or bsc one very important thing especially in context of pro members is impact and esg which is what i come from the impact investing background so you will see over there like five, fifth point these are the un sustainable development goals gender equality is there right you will see clean water and sanitation almost all of these are very you know uh, uh, they they affect women a lot so uh, there's a whole category of investors called impact investors or socially impactful impact investors who will not only look at the financial returns you will generate but who will also look at the social impact and the environmental impact that you will generate it's often called triple bottom line financial social and environmental that's why you call it triple bottom line business if you have a socially impactful business you will get lots of grants a foundation like a reliance foundation or a dell foundation or a gates foundation may give you free money to experiment because you're doing good for society while making money you also might get subsidized funding from development finance institutions the world bank might say i'm giving you going to give you a loan at 2% so you have all of these things the other thing which is very important from a very very important probably the most important after the founders is corporate governance can i trust you how are you running your company so a involvement of women a very very big corporate governance factor this research has shown especially from a flow perspective that companies which have senior management which have more women in the senior management are better likely to succeed a more likely to succeed. this is research showing it this is not me saying it auditor pedigree are you getting your local wo jo organic auditor to do it jo kuch bhi sign kar dega or are you getting for example a credible name like an eny or a kpmg or, or someone else to do it uh what is your board pedigree what are the kind of people that you have in your board do you have good independent directors or do you have any men apne apne chaacha chaacha mama tau ko sabko ghusa diya board so you know you have to have really good independent directors who will give you unbiased advice and who will not be fearful of speaking up uh do you have related party transactions acha i i have another company as a promoter yahan se paise nikalne ke liye maine wahan se yahan billing kar li 
मैंने वो सब वो घपला कर लिया पैसे घुमाने के लिए निकालने के लिए ऑल ऑफ दैट इज नॉट अलाउड एनी रिलेटेड पार्टी ट्रांजेक्शन डिस्कलोज टिपिकली इन्वेस्टर्स से आई नॉट गोट अलाउड दैट इज अंडर यू टेक माई परमिशन ऑन एम्प्लॉई प्रोटेक्शन एंड वेलनेस अगेन पॉश प्रिवेंशन ऑफ सेक्शुअल हेरसमेंट नेपोटिज्म ऑब्जेक्टिव अप्रेजल रादर देन समथिंग अ बॉस मिस यूजिंग दर पावर एम्प्लॉय कल्चर इज अ वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग when 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 raising funds the use of funds right i won't go into all of this i think it's very self explanatory but the concept of runway is very important jo main funding karke dunga aapko when i give you funding how long will it last you you know like a plane is going up on a runway so you have a specific runway right if you have a very large plane and a very short runway it's it will likely crash because it needs let's say 1 km to run before it can take off you only have a 500 meter runway to crash hi karega na similar thing in business If you if you need two million dollars to support yourself and you're only able to raise half a million dollars, then you'll crash. So what is your runway? The funding that I give you, will you be able to survive ten, twelve months, eighteen months, twenty-four months, or you'll be able to survive in perpetuity? You don't need more funding. Those are things that you have to understand. Uh, next thing, this is stages of capital raising, which Archana was coming to. I think her first question, right? So. If you look at it, the first thing that you do is the seed stage. When you are at idea stage, and nothing much is on the ground, you may have done little or no effort as an entrepreneur. Typically, the people who will support you at this point in time are your friends and family, people who you have trust with. So they will say, "Okay, Abhishek Fogla is running the business. I trust him, so I am going to put in money." So you give them preferential terms and conditions, etc., and you typically get them in at the seed stage. Nowadays, things have evolved. You also have seed stage commercial funders, so people who you have a relationship in the past. Who will interact with you and trust you and invest in your company at the seed stage? Then you have your angels, which is pretty much similar. Right? You will have high net worth individuals who will invest in your company, who are typically called angels. Then you have your early stage, Series A, Series B, etc. And as your company grows, your rounds start becoming larger and larger and larger, right? In capital raising, I'm happy to chat about this to any of you. Uh, post this thing because I have limited time, so I'm rushing. Financial projections, right? So. A lot of people are very intimidated by accession. Don't be. It's very simple and logical. Just build a 24 month, month on month cash position. कितना रोकड़ा आया और कितना रोकड़ा गया. Cash in and cash out. What are the cash inflow assumptions? Revenues. आपका कितना clients grow करेंगे month on month, July, August, September, October. What will be your average revenue per customer? अब कितना product बेचोगे उसको? Product की pricing क्या होगी? Standard assumptions. No? What will be the pace of ramp up? तो आज आपके 10 customer हैं. आपके नेक्स्ट मंथ ट्वेंटी कस्टमर्स होंगे फिर उसके नेक्स्ट मंथ फिफ्टी उसके नेक्स्ट मंथ एटी हंड्रेड सो वट इज द कर टिपिकली इट टू बी कर विच इज हॉकी स्टेक लाइक दिस राइजिंग वेरी फास्ट एंड वट इज योर क्रॉस सेल पोटेंशियल सो दिस विल गिव यू रेवेन्यूज एंड देन यू हैव फाइनेंशियल इंफ्लोस फ्रॉम कैश परसपेक्टिव हाउ मच ऑफ इक्विटी डू नीड एंड हाउ मच ऑफ डेट डू नीड सो यू पुट इन होल्डर्स इन एन एक्सेल शीट टू पुट दिस इन वेरी सिंपल and the expense assumptions you have as i told you the cost of goods sold which is the variable cost what is the price That it takes me. What is the cost that it takes me to, to manufacture one bottle of shampoo and get it to the hands of the consumer? That is called your variable cost. मतलब आप जितना product बेचोगे उतना cost होगा ही होगा आपका. The revenue minus your variable cost gives you your gross margin. Underneath your gross margin, you have fixed cost. So you have marketing cost, which is your customer acquisition cost. You have product development. So आपका centralized fixed cost होगा ना? Because of product development, you will have other central team cost like HR, finance. Or, or you know compliance this that you will have rent of the head office you will have telecommunication charges you will have courier charges you will have traveling charges so all of these things you will have right you will have consultancy charges so all of these things come in your head office or central cost when you remove all these from gross margin you come to what is called as ebitda earnings before interest tax depreciation and amortization most, most investors will ask you what is your gross margin and what is your ebitda again i am happy to chat with any of you Post this call, right? Uh, you know we can schedule a time, right? And I can take you through this in detail. Depreciation and amortization. What are these things? Very scary words. Basically, when you buy an asset like a car, right? Let's say you're a taxi company and you buy a car. Now you're not going to use the car in one year itself, na? No? So, आपने कार के लिए अगर दस लाख रुपए दिए हैं, you can't claim ten lakh rupees totally in one year because you are saying that okay, this car will last for four years. I will use it for four years. So every year, simplest. Basically, one way to do it is that two and a half lakh rupees should be apportioned every year to it. That is called depreciation when you have a capital asset or a computer or things like that. Uh, again, amortization is a little more complicated. I won't get into it. 
but when you put when you deduct from ebitda depreciation and amortization then you come to what is called as ebit evit earnings before interest and taxes then you put it the interest that you have on debt which comes you to your profit before tax in mold then you have your income taxes profit after tax and profit after tax is usually written on the balance sheet in fast growing companies in several later stage companies you have dividend payouts so let's say you generate 500 crores of profit in a mature company you may distribute to abhishek i have a just uh, to interrupt uh, i don't want to interrupt your flow but uh, i think these items most of the members would be familiar with so why don't we use the time to understand what you know experience you can bring as far as the funding is concerned okay great so uh, uh great so i will just quickly answer arshna's questions who is the earliest investor i think earliest investors are typically your family nowadays the landscape has evolved a lot to basically uh, you know uh, include commercial investors who come in at the seed stage or at early stages so you, it's a good time to be an entrepreneur if you are one number 2 debt or equity if you have a business which is uh, generally generate a lot of cash i would say focus on debt like for my own business excel fiduciary i raised debt i did not raise equity and we are now generating profits and we are paying back the debt so it really depends on a business to business case scenario whether you want to uh, raise debt or equity uh, it it's really uh, your call right it's it i mean you cannot generalize it it's a very uh, you know company specific call third thing is dilution uh, if you're looking at dilution uh, you know be generous right if you stick on to too much of your this thing investor will not be interested in your deal be generous with them but yes so tell them that okay for your money i will give you 25 30% of the company but 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 there's a big but if i perform well give me 5% of my company back so okay aap aap 25 taka bhi le lo theek hai main bol raha hu 20 taka lo aap bol rahe ho 25 taka loge koi baat nahi maine aapko 25 taka de diya i give you 25% but if i reach my business goals whatever objectives you have revenue customers profits whatever it is you can decide which should be the investor then you give me 5% back so everything is happy your concern is that what if i, I you know uh, this company goes bust or this company doesn't do well then it is the largest stake of the company but if this company really does well then i don't mind having paid more up front that's how it works so there are very structures to that and that's why archana said there are convertible transactions as well where you can say if you are unable to decide on the value and early stage valuation is more art than science right because you know it really depends on how much of traction you can build with your with the investors if you only have one investor in the race you're likely to get a very bad valuation if you have multiple horses running it's the same question of supply and demand which brings me to the point archana's first question of the investment banker please so, agya so in the you know i would advise you to go into a fundraising mode with an investment banker for two reasons number one fundraising consumes a lot of bandwidth him him you should potentially use your bandwidth to grow your business for you for any entrepreneur fundraising is a distraction it's an evil aapko chahiye wo it's a necessary thing but it's not going to help you grow your business metrics right it's not going to get you more customers it's like you have a car and you have to race but you need the fuel in the car so hire someone focus on getting your customers focus on building your product leave an expert a professional to basically get you your money is what i would advise you to do secondly uh, the investment banker will also bring in a lot of strategic inputs a lot of my early stage clients i give them strategic inputs on the business you should do this you should not do this you should focus on this product that product because i am seeing the market i have a view of things now whether they take my advice or not is up to them but i can tell them that this is the way this is the issues that you have even before going to the market and any investors want to see in you so let's focus on mitigating those issues the third thing is uh, you know my expertise right the number of investors that i know because i've been doing this for 15 years you will never know those 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 number of investors i know what games they play i know within let's say a particular investor who is the person we should reach out to it's not necessarily important to reach out to the md every time you may have a vice president or an associate over there who is very dynamic who will be able to better the visibility with the investor than when you approach the md directly so so an investment banker will know who to approach where to approach and most importantly they will help you with negotiation because if if an investment banker really markets your deal very well really creates a lot of traction in the market you are going to get better terms and conditions you are going to get a better valuation 
if you have a very good company and you have one investor interested please listen to this very carefully this is the crux of a negotiation if you have a very 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 good company and you only have one shot at entrepreneurship typically for normal people right you need to market it as wide as possible cast the net as wide as possible if you have only one uh, you know investor in the race it's probable ki wo they will give you a bad offer because they know that there is no one else competing you can cry from the rooftop for 10000 hours are mera ye acha hai mera wo acha hi hai kuch nahi kaam karne wala the moment you say are bhai sahab dekhiye dekhiye you know your offer is very nice but frankly we have a better offer on the table right we have someone else who is willing to give so thank you very much if you're going to give you if you want to give me on my terms then i will take it otherwise i won't suddenly the investor who you are trying to convince for all these months which is like acha 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 offer okay okay let me look at it and come back so you know it is what we call as fomo fear of missing out everyone has it in the world it's called basic insecurity are baba some some other investor will 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 will, will uh, walk away with the deal i won't get it so those are the things that you need to really focus on which a banker can help you focus on i think i answered all your four questions uh, acha uh, yes. git for your sorry uh, can you please repeat your question git once again what experiences should i talk about what example should i talk about <laughs> Uh, Abhishek, I have a question. My name is Malu. Uh, I'm the chairperson of Flow. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, if Archana organizes a session, I try not to miss it. And you've been one of the best speakers so far. Uh, it was a crash course on what you need to know about business plan, and didn't know who to ask. Um, you know, we did a survey recently with about hundred uh, members, Flow members, Pan India. Yes, and um, uh, this was more to write a write a report on women entrepreneurs and what we noticed was a lot of them had not gone in for funds and so we reached out to a few to ask them why and you know they start their business one is they are not looking at uh, taking it to the next level because of these uh, the fear factor some of them you mentioned because you know business model the way you explain the whole thing looks so simple but it's it's very difficult for these youngsters and for these women to write a business plan so is there somebody out there who would help these um, you know upcoming startups you know we're not talking about the big big timers but the young ones to help them in terms of how do you how do you come up with your first plan and um, cost could be a factor for them as well and also in terms of understanding who's out there and who can help them out and um, the other thing abhishek is we are building a cell uh, you know we're trying to come up with various verticals one is legal one is compliance one is uh, you know including things like developing a business plan and so on we right. need people to come on board to help us out because we have we know there are lots of entrepreneurs out there struggling with the space uh, of their business sure ma'am so i think there's no so you need to contact up see most chartered accountants right who run cfa firms you know i don't you know particularly like dealing with them from a business plan perspective because you know they have a very short term thing they'll give you all the business plan but you know at the end they'll remove all the formulas and then they will paste the values to you and they'll give it to you so you don't know the logic so Correct. hire a good investment banker or hire any their budget investment banker is also available or hire a finance professional who can help you navigate the business plan who can help you think through it see one is to just enter it on excel that a lot of even even any mba student can do typically from a reasonably good school so what is more important is to get a person who can not only input those things and build a excel sheet for you which will outline the crux of your company but will also tell you that you know this doesn't look right this is going to get you know, uh, uh, this is going to get argued upon this is something that that people will have a hard time swallowing so can give you so i think uh, uh uh you know in my firm we 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 do write business plans for people uh, once okay. in a while mm -hmm. uh, so i think there are many other firms who would be willing to do that you just have to focus on finding the right firm man i think i think malu we can hijack abhishek for our helpline series <laughs> that that was my next question to him but i'll leave it to you to do that thanks abhishek thank you appreciate that uh, so uh, yeah, okay i think i think a lot of women right so for example i didn't share something about you which i think will be uh, malu ma'am will be very uh, close to your heart i used to uh, uh, one of my clients used to be uh, clay schools clay schools i don't know if you know them but they're india's largest daycare company the founder mm -hmm. uh, madam priya krishnan who's a close friend of mine 
she's a amazing entrepreneur right and uh, she built it with a singular motive of bringing women back to work so basically once they get kids most women you know sort of you know lose off on their career and never able to come back at that thing so she said and primarily because they can't leave the children in places where they can trust so either you have grandparents but people like let's say for me or people like archana who have young kids and who don't have joint families or their parents who they live with you know you require these professional services where you can leave your child in a safe setting both from an education and care perspective so i had them raise uh, a lot of money in the past i used to be uh, you know uh, doing uh, outsource cfo services to them as well so these are the kind of women who i get very inspired by and i am telling you women entrepreneurship is waiting to take off you i, I would be more than overjoyed to to play any role that i can within flow to motivate women to to become entrepreneurs to to basically uh, you know as i say uh, you know leave the shore and sail into the sea yeah we have many priyas in flow so we would love to have you on board yes <laughs> so archana will i think will take the lead in uh, you know working out the structure of that help uh, one of the members had a question uh, yes, whether uh, it's a good thing for the uh, the entrepreneur to invest his own money in the business whether that is a good thing or that's not only good ma'am it's essential i see you see you never go to an outside source for funding until so i always tell my clients beg borrow steal get all your funds invested into it and then only go for outside capital because the day you go in for outside capital when you invest capital into your own company it will be at 10 rupees per share typically or one or face value per share when you go to an investor right they will come in at a higher valuation that's what you will expect correct once they come in at let's say 30 rupees a share they are not going to allow you to put more come more, more capital into the company your own capital two years later you say are meko i am a promoter i want to do it at 10 rupees per share nahi hone wala so delay capital raising as long as you can use your own sources of capital so that is a to reduce dilution b it is also the biggest uh, you know vote of confidence because the investor will say ki acha all this sweat and blood is okay but how much of your own capital have you invested so i have clients or i have had clients who have staked everything so their their houses in which they say they have mortgaged it they have taken the mortgage amount and put it into the business whatever they had they have done it and they continue to do it and entrepreneurs uh, investors love those kind of entrepreneurs so yes it's not only good it's not only advisable it is essential if there is an investor who sees that you have not invested your own money they're not fools they're not going to come in and invest their own time and money with you your own capital is the biggest vindication okay uh, thank you and uh, another question which is coming up is Uh, how do you know when it is a good time to go for an ipo rather than uh, explore the vc opportunities so in ipo again see you have sme ipos as well but you please research something called as market depth so if you, if you are ipo right but let's say you are an uh, you are a listed company but you are a small cap company now i place an order for shares of let's say 5 lakh rupees only 5 lakhs or oh, 5 lakh order may there are not enough sellers but my order leads to the stock price jumping up by 20% or 25% it happens because there is no depth in the market now if you go to an itc or a hindustan unilever or you go to a procter and gamble or you go to an airtel you pay a 5 lakh rupee order is not going to make any dent because you have a very deep investor base over there is market depth in it so it really depends when you are doing an ipo do not do it for less than 500 crores your minimum market capitalization post ipo has to be at least 1500 or 2000 crores that is when the foreign institutional investors the fii start getting uh, interested in it the fiis are the ones who drive your stock price up you will see that when a small cap becomes a mid cap automatically you know the share price goes up because there are more investors who are interested in it when a mid cap becomes a large cap again the stock price jumps so you have to have a minimum market capitalization because fiis will not be interested in a business which has let's say 200 crores of market capitalization at least 2000 2500 crores of market capitalization should be there so conversely if i just take a one step back right uh, if you're doing an ipo you would at least sell 30 40% of your company so if you take 30 40% of a post ipo valuation of 2500 crores 
you should at least do a 7000 750 or 1000 crore ipo if you have 40% of your shares which are which are floating about in the public that is a reasonable chunk for, for the the higher the valuation the more the market depth the more the valuation will, you know the more the fis will be interested so that i think will guide an, an ipo if you are not at that stage so if you don't have revenues of let's say at least 300 to 500 crores don't even think of ipo go in for a vc or a pe option okay uh another member wants to know is it necessary to be a private limited company to raise uh, finance from uh, angel investors or private equity investors uh no technically you can be a public so there's a difference between a public company and a listed company not all public companies are listed so if you have more than a certain number of shareholders right then you become a public you really have to become be known as a public company otherwise you're a private company typically Typically, most VCP VCP rounds happen in private companies, but I have seen enough and more deals happen with public companies. And in fact, there is a certain degree of investments called PIE, private investment in public equity (PIPE). Private investment in public equity. So I have done fair number of deals where there are listed companies, but where there is a private equity investor who is interested. So you get a private equity investor to do a block deal. in a in a publicly limited company in, in a publicly listed company uh, and take let's say 20% or 25% or whatever it is without triggering the the open offer regulations right but also uh, the other aspect is that if you compare it with a sole proprietorship or a partnership or an llp then it is always advisable to convert into a private limited company when you're looking at raising funds because the investors are not going to a feel comfortable because when there is an llp or a partnership there's no structure to it as against a private limited company where there are processes so one part is what abhishek spoke about in terms of public and private but if you are an llp or a partnership and you're looking at raising funds i would suggest you first convert into a private limited company so so two other points to what archana said if you're a partnership by law right it's unlimited liability if you're a simple partnership so no investors want to come in and take unlimited liability acha I have a net worth of 200 crores. Tomorrow you go up and uh, you know do a 50 crore. Uh, you know you bring on a 50 crore liability on your company. The company goes bankrupt, but those people are chasing me because it's a partnership, right? So I will get screwed then. So partnerships, so people will not even touch the barge pole. In LLPs, you know it brings the best of both worlds in. But LLPs are good for let's say family-owned businesses or things like that, right? Where you have one or two or three partners coming in, not more than that. if you want to really create a large company you don't find llps which are listed do you so it only happens with companies it's the cleanest structure to have i see uh, sorry geet ma'am i am more than happy to continue i realize we are out of time but i am more than happy to continue if people are willing to stay on i am more than happy to continue as much as possible i think uh, archana you will uh, uh, i think what uh, would be uh, most uh, you know best way forward would be for uh, you for rachna to share your number and uh, email id with uh, the members and if they have any specific questions uh, they can uh, reach out to you uh, so is there uh, anything else uh, rachna you would like to continue right now or uh, any I specific think uh, probably take one last question if anyone wants to unmute and ask and then we can wrap up the session okay uh, i more minutes actually, actually i had one question now in this whole business plan you've been talking about revenue but what about uh, social development projects there you don't have any uh, you know revenue to talk about so what do, what does an investor look for in a social okay. project social projects can be neither not for profit or for profit right yeah uh, so if you have not for profit anyways you're not going to get an investor you can only get a donor that's a very different uh, you know uh, class of capital right you have donor capital so you can approach the world bank you can approach various government institutions you can approach people like the dell foundation gates foundation ford foundation and they will say okay i give you so many funds and you have to, you have to give me a fund deployment thing. that's a very different thing right because it's not for profit thing. Are enough and more for-profit companies, right, who are looking to raise capital, right? Wherein you are doing social projects. So, for example, one of the clients that I raised funds for, and I did two rounds of fundraising for them, cumulating to 80 crores of equity, 
was for a company which makes these ophthalmic devices, right? Which can screen the back of your eye. You can go to any optician and get your power tested. That's not a problem. But if you want to find out things like diabetic retinopathy, which is a big killer, it can lead to irreversible blindness or glaucoma or age-related macular degeneration. So you have no people, you have no, no framework or no ecosystem where you can get the back of your eye tested. You only have to go to a good hospital with that infrastructure. You don't have an affordable angle. Now, these people have you know, a very rugged device which can be replaced for it at a very, very low cost. I'm saying that that is also a social project. It's a for-profit project. And the biggest investor in the world, you know, people like Axel Partners have invested in people like IDG Venture, Axel Partners, the, 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 the Bourbon family, the Dabur family. These are the kind of investors that I've bought into this company, for example. I'm just telling you that social projects can be both for-profit. I specialize in for-profit social projects. So anything which has a masculine impact right, will be definitely fundable in a proper way. Okay, there are so many questions. I don't know now, uh, you know, whether to ask or uh, Abhishek, it has been very enlightening. And I know we have just sort of, uh, you know, not even touched the tip of the iceberg as far as uh, our curiosity is concerned. But we would definitely... I uh, like to have uh, more time with you and uh, Archana. Uh, I hope uh, we can uh, use your, uh, you know, uh, the channel that you have established with him to ensure that more of our members can use your expertise in a much uh, deeper way. Can we uh, hope to do that, Abhishek? Um, so, anytime you want, as I said, for me, Fiki Flow is very close to my heart because. I strongly feel for women entrepreneurship. I, 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 I strongly feel for women empowerment. In fact, I would like to see an India where there are no reservations for women. Right? I would like to see an India where women are treated equally. I would like to see an India where the sex ratio is uh, not in the, you know, not, not, not below 1000. I, I don't want to see a, a, a Haryana for that a better example. I want to see a Kerala where the sex ratio is actually more than a thousand. So I, I want people to welcome girl children and say that, okay. And, you know, I think it's very well established that in fact, daughters will take better care of their parents when they're older than sons, you know? <laughs> uh, so, so I strongly believe in, 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 in Fiki uh, and especially the flow initiative. And I will do whatever possible in my capacity. I'm happy to hold as many workshops, as possible, I'm happy to talk one to one with your members. I'm more than happy to do whatever is in my power, right? Uh, you know, uh, and gratis. I, I don't want to charge people, you know, uh, you know, for for some smaller device, etc. They are more than happy to call me on my number or email me. I will get back to you gratis. You know, of course, if it's a big project and you want me to make a business plan, I will have to charge you. But otherwise, if you're a Flow member, I will give you small bits of advice gratis. I, I will give you, you can pick my brain for free. That's what I can offer to you, ma'am. And I'm happy to hold as many gratis workshops as possible. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll speak to you on that. That's really, really helpful. And thank you and, so much for and, such an interesting session. It was yeah. so detailed and you have beautifully explained to us, you know, so many nuances of capital raise. And, yes. you know, this has been really helpful. Thank you so much. I, I just, and, uh, Abhishek, I just, could you share this presentation with Archana uh, so that you I, can I share have, it with all the members? They would. Uh, I have already done. Right? So okay. Archana, I, I just yeah. wanted to touch on two quick points before we sign off. Uh, these are the common VC terms which are there. These are very technical in nature, so would require a longer discussion. You can probably Google these terms, but these are the most important terms which are there. And Archana is a hundred x better expert than me in, on these things. Uh, and there are five, six different types of due diligences, which you should be prepared for when raising capital. This is very important. I didn't get a chance to talk about this. Commercial means when you form a business plan, the assumptions that you take, are they just stupid assumptions or are they realistic in nature? So pretty, pretty much sometimes investors do commercial due diligence themselves or they hire a third party to vet the assumptions that are going into your business plan in the numbers to see how realistic are your numbers. Then you have the financial due diligence, which looks at your tax and non-tax things. Non-tax could be what are your capital assets, whether you have uh, you know met your financial obligations in the past or not, 
what are your receivables right uh, what are your payables your receivables your working capital cycles do you have bad debts things like that legal again getting into your board minutes your shareholder minutes all of those things right all, you know your your pt registration professional tax provident fund gratuity labor laws environmental laws all of the things that apply to you shop and establishment tax and your ip diligence if you have an ip oriented company where you have where you claim to have some ip is there some other ip which conflicts with it which can put it in potentially uh, lead to a dispute right because if i'm investing in your company based on your ip then i don't want to end up in a situation where I, where it goes into a dispute so this ip diligence this environmental diligence especially where you have the things like hotels where you have things like where where it involves you know some factory etc so what is your waste management technique pollution techniques you know pollution control etc so you have environmental due diligence and then i think the most important which people are looking at is forensic due diligence aapki niyat kya hai are you a good person so they will actually the people who have been part of central bureau of investigation in the past who have left it and who now do research and tell you that this is the kind of thing you know is this guy having uh, you know uh, has he cheated in the past does he have an excess with mafia does he have an excess with politicians is he cheating on his wife or uh, is she cheating on his husband so all of these things will somehow fit into the kind of person that you are because ultimately you may have the best business plan the best idea in the world but if i can't trust you with my money if i don't trust you if you're going to cheat uh, on, on the money with me then you're not no good to me so forensic due diligence i just want to do very very quickly touch on these points which are very very important from a fundraising perspective thank you abhishek uh, i think we'll have to leave at this point yeah uh, we all have other meetings to go to but uh, yes we will be in touch with you again and uh, thank you for making it sound uh, so easy and you know more making us more confident about uh, approaching uh, investors for finance so thank you for your time and sharing your learning with us and we will be in touch again thank you members for being such a lovely audience and coming up with your questions and uh, thank you arshana for bringing uh, abhishek onto startup caravan <laughs>